Welcome to The Robbie Rose Show. I am the host, Robbie Rowland. I want to personally thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Alan Jaeger. Now let's hear a little sound bite from Alan himself. My arm is attached to my shoulder, not yours. You know, it's as funny as that sounds. I've told us to players, especially at your level, you have a quadruple PhD in your arm from Harvard or Stanford or <laughs> Princeton or Yale. Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome to The Robbie Rose Show, episode 58.2, part two of a three-part episode with my guy, Alan Jager. Um, Today, this episode is being released Wednesday. The reason that I say that is because the contest that Alan and I have partnered on is still going on. It was released Monday. Um, For those of you who do not know about the contest, I encourage you to see the show notes. I will link the tweet that uh, will have all the details as far as how to get entered into this contest that Alan and I are running. But uh, the contest started on Monday when uh, when the first part of the episode was released. It will end on Thursday night, so if you're listening to this on Wednesday, it will end Thursday night at 8 Eastern, um, so don't miss it out. If you haven't uh, haven't checked it out already, um, the contest is airing on Twitter. There's a couple rules, regulations you got to follow to enter the contest, and uh, basically Alan will be giving uh, the winner um, a complete competitor package with elite J bands. So definitely want to jump in to that contest, which will be um, held on the platform Twitter. So go ahead and go check out uh, that contest. Like I said, I'll link the the tweet that I had that will qualify you to enter the contest in the show notes. Basically, it's one tweet. It's the tweet that had the link of the first episode in it and uh, also kind of giving you the description of how to enter the contest. Um, So, yeah, there's that. Um, Hope everyone is is doing well. Hope everyone enjoyed that first part of the episode. I know I did. Um, Obviously, it's no secret that Alan is one of the leaders in the, the industry when it comes to developing arm strength, developing really just a healthy and uh, long baseball career. So uh, appreciate Alan again for, for coming on, taking time out of his day to, to give us all of his wisdom, if you will. So at this time, I uh, want to talk to you guys a little bit about my one-time mechanical video analysis that I, that I do on my website. I know I get uh, tons of questions each and every day, and I try to try to answer those questions in, in this podcast just so when people do listen to it, they don't have a, a bunch of questions um, you know, regarding the, the logistics of it. Basically what it is is uh, you go to my website, uh, www.therobbyroshow.com. You'll see in there an option to do mechanical video analysis. Um, if, you, uh, if you want a little bit more simple way to go there, you can literally go to my Instagram bio, or you can just look into your show notes and it'll take you to a direct link to that mechanical video analysis uh, site. Um, so for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, I, I, I charge about $40. Um, if you're a podcast listener, I get you 20% off um, just uh, at discount. Uh, the discount code is Robbie Rose Show. Uh, at checkout. So basically what it is, is I asked for two videos, one from the center field angle, one from the open side angle. Uh, you send those my way. I throw those into an app, which allows me to slow it down, draw on it, determine any deficiencies that I see. Um, and then what I do is I take a video of myself and kind of put all those things into, into life. And just so you don't have to sit there and visualize what, you know, what it actually is. Um, you can just, you know, see what I'm doing and then uh, determine for yourself, but yeah, that, that's just a one-time charge. Um, I've, have seen a lot of success, honestly, from from guys doing it. So appreciate you guys. Um, let's get to uh, let's get to the episode uh, with uh, Alan Jager. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, you know what's funny, man, is I, I see. I, I I mean, I'm going into my tenth professional season, man, and and I, the the common occurrence that I typically see within those first couple weeks of spring training is uh, is guys come in. And, uh, you know, they, they throw their two bullpens or, you know, 
mound boxes or whatever they call them these days, and and then they're ready to go in a game. They do their live BP, then they go into a spring training game. Blah blah blah. Two or three weeks goes by. Um, as you know, spring training is a very like you know hustling thing. You know, you got to come into camp like ready to compete. And I hear it over and over again. Guys come in and they're like, "Gosh, my arm is sore. Um, you know, I'm not recovering. All this stuff." And I always like I always kind of point to you know that what how did you feel in the off season? You know, and typically I'm sure you hear the same thing, man. Everyone feels good in the off season, right? And the correlation that I've kind of seen is like when they're in the off season, they know they don't have to face hitters on. Wednesday if it's Sunday so then they they throw as far as they can or they have fun long tossing because long tossing is freaking fun man so you know you throw them with your buddy as far as you can and then naturally they just feel really really good over the course of the off season then they get into spring training and they slam on the brakes because um, you know the, the coordinator said hey you have a, a pen Monday Wednesday alive on Friday and then you're in the game on Monday. And then they so they go crap like I got to save my bullets you know so like what do you, what would you say to those guys I mean obviously a lot of my listeners are kind of shooting for that goal of potentially being in a spring training uh, at some point in their career what would you kind of advise them to do for for a spring training? Well, hopefully that syndrome is starting to go away. And also in another article that I participated with Eric Cressy and Mike Reinold on about. The Tommy John danger zone, the first 10 days of spring training, and I've got to some clubs with this, and it, it has changed, luckily. But as you said, the bullpen every other day thing, first of all, you never do that in the offseason. You never do that as a pitcher anyway, so that doesn't make any sense. You can't probably put an arm in more danger and more vulnerability by bullpenning it every other day when it is never it never does that, number one. Number two, by bullpenning every other day, you're not allowing for recovery and, and endurance and build up. And you're not, like you said, all of a sudden you're starting to think, like, I can't do a lot of throwing. i got to save my arm. So if that ever happens to a player, hopefully it doesn't. But if that happens again, there's two things to do. One is you, you talk to the pitching coordinator. You talk to the farm director. You talk to the head strength and conditioning coach. Because if you break down the logic of it, no one's going to agree with the logic. I don't know why they do it, but no one's going to agree with the logic. So hopefully they just – acquiesce and let you kind of skip one of those pens so you can go Monday, Friday, which would make more sense. Number two, if you're kind of, in a way, you just kind of can't do anything. Your organization has their policy. They don't want to talk to you about it. They believe they're doing it the right way, um, which those are the really archaic, you know, old, old school kind of mentality. They're out there. Uh, they exist. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess, well here's, here's the other out is let's say Monday, you're pen, let's say you're Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Well, Monday, I'm going to get a great long toss in. I'm going to pen according to my needs. And then what, that Tuesday, I'll do what I do, maybe 200, 220, stretch it out. And Wednesday, I'm going to stretch it out totally again because I want to keep my conditioning cycle going, right? And then I may pull down medium just because I pen on Monday. When I get on the mound for them on Wednesday, I'm going 40 to 60% max. I'm basically throwing with little effort to where it has zero effect on my arm. Now, if they ask me to throw harder, I'm going to tell them flat out. If I throw harder right now, I feel like this is going to cause an injury. And the word injury, no one wants to hear. And you've actually also created a paper trail if you do get injured. Yeah. So they're like, what do you mean you're going to get injured? And you just explain your situation. I'm like, this is not what my arm wants to do. It doesn't feel right. So the moral story is this. You use Wednesday as just a simple long toss flush day. If you happen to be on a bump, it's no big deal because you're still throwing 40%. And then Thursday, you're going to probably feel like going out to, again, 200, 225, stretching it out. Friday is a beast mode long toss day. Fully stretch it out, fully pull down, do whatever you want on the mound. So you actually use Wednesday. You eliminate it as a pen day. They may think you're on, it's a pen day. <laughs> yeah, it's not a pen day. It's not a pen day anymore. It's it's just it's a glorified. You have to be stepping on a mound. You're making an extra twenty pitches, not on flat ground after your long toss session is over. It's not a pen. Um, it's end of conversation. If you if you don't do it that way, you are putting your arm in jeopardy. It's it's 
it's really the scariest time of year for professional pitchers, the first 10 days of spring training. Well, you know what? It, it, for, for me, man, it, it, it always goes back to it's your career. And, you know, unfortunately, that wasn't something that I learned until I got released uh, for the for my first time. I didn't learn, you know, because I, I was, uh, again, like I was stuck in that similar position um, as, as some guys are where you're constantly trying to please the organization, right? They're cutting the checks. They have... Um, they have full control of your career and where you go. So all you want to do is, you know, yes, sir. Right. So you kind of get stuck in that mold of, you know, okay, I guess I'll do this. I guess I'll do that. But, um, and that's the, the beauty of these podcasts. And that's what I love about doing them, man, is to supply the individuals that haven't really gotten there yet. Supply them with that knowledge that look like at the end of the day, you know, it's not your coordinator's career. When you, you know, when you go out and you blow out an arm or you give up nine and two thirds, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not on his, not on his name. So, you know, again, it goes back to understanding yourself, understanding the routines that work for you. Um, I know my audience probably gets sick of me saying that cause I probably say it at least twice a show, but I mean, it's so true, right? Um, you know, just understanding yourself and understanding what works for you and what doesn't. Well, I'll add, that's, and I love what you said because it's right up my alley. And I'll add one more piece to that. I've told this to players a lot lately because luckily a lot of major league teams are getting a lot better at this individuality and, and listening to the players as opposed to imposing, you know, their theories or their, you know, in a lot of cases I consider to be restrictions on the players. But for the players that are still dealing with, as you said, you know, the organizations out there that are just really oppressive and rigid and highly conservative and not into individuality, you have to kind of hit them where it hurts, meaning you have to kind of, you have to stand your ground and say, look, my arm is attached to my shoulder, not yours. You know, it's as funny as that sounds. I've told us to play, especially at your level, you have a quadruple PhD in your arm from Harvard or Stanford or Princeton or Yale, you know, or Cambridge. You can go around the world, pick the top universities. You have a quadruple PhD in your arm. You'll never meet anybody. And they could be the greatest pitching coach in the world, and they could be a, a great teacher. You're just not going to meet anybody that has technically a high school diploma in your arm compared to you. Now, that doesn't mean. There's not doctors and trainers that can't do tests, stress tests on your arm and teach you stuff about your arm. I'm not going there. I'm just right. saying when it comes to you intuitively, and that's the key word here, intuitively, knowing or instinctively, knowing your own arm and body, you are in a different galaxy than anybody you meet. So if you're letting someone else tell you what to do when your arm is attached to your shoulder, and that's the takeaway. Next time a coach or someone tells you why they want you at 120 or on a line or you get this many throws today, and, and say it in a polite, non, you know, non-passive, aggressive way, but just say, look, why are you telling me what to do when my arm is attached to my shoulder? Yeah. It's that simple. There's no debate here. There's no discussion anymore. Yeah. If you're dealing with a kid that's 10 years old and doesn't know the first thing about throwing... I understand why you might want to impose some guidelines or strong suggestions is maybe how I'd say it. But please, in this day and age with the internet and these kids out there in the world, man, it's impressive how much they're studying or their parents are studying or their coaches are studying or their advisor is studying or people like you are out there putting out content. It is impressive how much great – yeah, some people say there's too much information. Bottom line is this. There's so much great resourceful information out there. These kids generally in high school already and definitely by college and definitely by pro ball, they are so educated. And you use the word routine more than once today. They know their routine so well that major league teams, this is what I've been pleading with organizations lately to do. Do inventory on every kid you've drafted or signed. Bring them in and find out what they're doing. You'll be shocked at the trends of what they're doing across the board, and you'll also learn how important it is to acquiesce to them and, and lean on them because these kids are educated and smart and very well developed, generally speaking. So your arm is attached to your shoulder. Please never, ever lose sight of that. 
<laughs> it's so true, man. And I think as we progress in a society or in a baseball industry, like you said it, dude, there's so much information out there. Whereas like I have a conversation with a kid on Instagram and we're messaging back and forth and I don't know his age, but the way he's talking to me, I'm thinking like maybe he's a college kid and he comes out and he's like a freshman in high school and it happens over and over again. I'm like, holy crap. And that's just a testament to the, the quality of information out there that people are, you know, are constantly supplying individuals with content. Um, it's, it's no joke, dude. Um, so that's a, that's a message. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'll be brief. So I know you may want to move on, but just to add one last piece to that. So many kids nowadays are, when I look online, and part of it is because these different academies or pitching schools, it's it's really cool. They'll post like a picture of a bunch of their kids doing J-bands or long tossing up into a net, something we've pushed hard with you know, a lot of information lately for the inclement weather cities across the country you know, during the winter time. And I'll just see, like, I, it's, it's so mind-blowing how many academies are out there in schools and... And then obviously you have things like Driveline and the Ranch and people going with their Sierra Cressy. And for those three people I'm naming, there's another 3,000, right? And totally. They're everywhere. And, you know, there's these there's D-Bat Academies now. And I mean, it's just on and on and on. Um, and so what I love about that is that it seems like these academies are doing their homework. And I know because we're getting a lot of calls and, and orders from them. You know, whether it's j bands, whether it's plow balls, you know, whether it's the body blade, you know, whether it's, you know, slow-mo, high-caption video stuff for spin and rotation and, you know, all the new, you know, metrics that are out there. Um, it, it's impressive, is my point. These kids, and partly maybe it's the kids, and partly maybe it's their parents, and partly maybe it's the coaches, but... But my point is this, man. There, there is so much information out there where these kids are training in these environments, and I think professional world. Kyle Peterson actually said something about it in a call in the World Series last year that it seems like the professional world now is making an adjustment in realizing how well the college world is developing arms. Not to mention probably, you know, of course, everything else. But let's just take yeah. arms. And that go to school on that because the Nate Yeskies and Scott Browns and Butch Thompsons of the world go to school on what they're doing. And and for those three guys I've named, I can name 50 more guys. Like Robert Woodard, Matt Hoff, I can bounce around this country. Kirk Sorrows. I mean, it's it's in the Steve Smith who's at uh, Auburn. It, it, it's it's and I feel bad I'm missing people. Skyler Mead at South Carolina. <laughs> I gotta name them all. <laughs> <laughs> this better at Michigan. I can go around the country right now, and I can name fifty pitching coaches in about ninety seconds. That to me are in such an elite category from a training and developmental and open-minded and an adaptation, and it's it's so cool. And I think that's why the pro world is being really smart by looking at what the colleges are doing. And oh, by the way, not an irony that the pro world is starting to hire so many coaches or oh, yeah. people outside the organization, like from Driveline, for instance. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry for the long-winded answer. No, dude, never apologize for, for just quality information like that, man. That's, that's awesome. Um, I do kind of want to switch gears a little bit. We talk about the, the development of kids, and I think a lot of – a lot of that is being correlated from the demand for velocity that we're seeing in today's game, right? So I, I know just in the last decade, I think the average mile an hour fastball went from like 88, 9 to 93 something, I think it is now. So obviously, like the demand for velocity is there. I think the secret is out that the velocity matters. Um, so I know a lot of these kids are going to these programs and, and demanding a lot of the you know velocity out of themselves. For me, my biggest velocity jump, I think, came when obviously you and I were in, were in communication, I think, that offseason in 14 going into 15. And I remember a specific conversation that you and I had in regards to my pull-down phase of my long toss. I remember always putting a lot of weight, um, putting a lot of emphasis into how far I could throw the ball. And, you know, and it's funny. Remember that video I, I sent you over Twitter? That thing went viral, man. That was cool. Um, or 
Baby. Oh yeah, 400 club, babe. Um, but anyways, I remember always thinking just it was all about how far I could throw it, and then you know I kind of would just, for lack of a better term, walk through my pull down phase. But I remember after you know we had that conversation about how to go about the pull downs right. I think that's when I finally started, you know, really seeing that uptick in velocity. I'd like for you to kind of elaborate a little bit on what that pull down phase. Um, looks like because I do think it's something that can get overlooked when talking about um, a throwing routine. Yeah, for sure. Well, one thing about throwing distance is, you know, because there are two parts and they are both so profoundly important. But the stretching out part, like you want to go out to foreign feet, and why, and why it does feel so good is you are building range of motion, you're building athleticism, and you're building endurance. The further out you go, the more throws you're making. So that's why there's so many pluses. The pull-down phase, as you said, I think what happens is, is that if you look at someone from the side and they're pulling down and it's got some hair on it, it looks good no matter what because you can see the ball's got some life and carry. But a true pull-down for me is an art form, and not many people can do it without, I think, really gaining some nuance insight. And here's the nuance insight. This is a conversation, of course, you and I had. So let's say use 300 feet is a, is a simple number, 90 miles an hour, give or take. If you go to 300 feet, which is great, and you start coming in, you know we come in about 10 feet of throw, 290, 280, 70. What tends to happen is you can't really tell what a real pull down is like in the first 150 feet. So it all looks the same. It's like I'm getting on top of it. I'm lowering my arc. It, 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 I'm throwing harder. So you can't really tell like the, the discrepancy, if you will, from... 300 to maybe 220 to 150, but here, here's the takeaway. When you start getting 150 and in, that's where players will tend to really decelerate a little bit for a number of reasons. One is they don't want the ball to go over their partner's head. It doesn't look good theoretically. Two, um, they want to play catch. That's the idea. So you ease up a little bit to make sure you hit your partner. Three, we're all built with playing catch is playing catch, not playing chase, so you just subconsciously don't want to miss your partner, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then four, it's an art form to maintain your furthest throw that day, which we're going to call X, to maintain X at 300 feet all the way back into your throwing partner is not easy to do. It's literally, um, it's, 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 a, it's sort of a magic trick until you learn how to do it. So if you don't even know how to do this properly, and you don't know what you don't know, then making a quote-unquote technically sound pull-down is going to be really, really hard to do. So those are the main reasons why players generally don't pull down correctly. A correct pull-down, back to your question, is as simple as this. Whatever your max distance is that day, again, we're going to call X, so 300 feet is X. Now, assuming it is a pull-down day, you're going to come in with full intent. The, the goal is, is to maintain... X all the way back into your throwing partner. So whether you're at 292 or 186 or 64 feet, I tell guys at your level, you probably can't come in much closer to 70 feet without really being dangerous to do this right. So I'm going to use 70 feet as sort of your last throw. If you can gear up a catcher and get, get to 60 feet, 6 inches, that's optimal. Yeah. Um, with a face mask, by the way. <laughs> so, so to answer the question is this, back to this. 300 feet is X, 270 is X, 180 is X. As you know, the closer you get to your partner, the more you're going to want to decelerate or, or, or you know, figure out a way to make sure you don't throw over his head. Or... So what we tell our players to do is two things. One, at all costs, do not decelerate one foot of the throw. I don't care where the ball goes. You have to throw 300 feet every throw coming in. And the cool thing is, as athletes, that pretty much once you get to about high school and above, you know it your furthest throw felt like, you know what full intent feels like. There's no gray area. Mm -hmm. So number one is do not decelerate one foot of your throw, and two, miss lower than higher. So I've had players who are learning this the first time to make sure that they have the, the relief in their mind to, to not, you know, feel vulnerable. I'm like, look, you can miss 50 feet in front of your throwing partner as long as you maintain full intent. They're like, okay, I get that. So what happens is a, is a real pull down is when you start getting to 190 and 80 feet, these are classic cases where 
look, you still could throw a 270 out of 300 feet, and it's going to look impressive, and it's going to have some hair on it. Yeah. It's not a pull down. The real pull down is, can you still throw it 300 feet at 90 feet? And in our world, we actually want you missing like five high or lower. And really, when you get to about 70 feet, we want you missing shin height or lower, which is not easy to do without the bump. And what happens now is you get into a new world of quick twitch muscle, if you will, or just centrifugal force, leverage, explosiveness, acceleration, or at least not deceleration throwing. When you can take a 300-foot throw, which is X, maintain X, which is your full intent, and when you can do that at 90 feet, 80 feet, 70 feet, 60 feet, if you ever catch your gear up, and this shin high or lower, with all 300 feet, that's a full, that's a real pull down. And there's not, and I've done this for 28 years, and I'm telling you, I've had some very, very advanced athletes do this. And yeah, usually within one session or within maybe eight or ten throws, they start, they can start to get it. It usually takes a few sessions before they really get it because we're so used to decelerating for all the reasons I mentioned at the beginning of this. And so that would be the goal for a pitcher to work on because your question, Robbie, is so important for this reason. I've had so many questions over the years say, I'm getting out to 300 or 330 or 360 or, in your case, 400 feet. Why am I only at 85 or 88 or, in your case, might have been 93 or 4 when I should probably be throwing five miles or harder? Right. This question comes up so much. And I always come back to the same answer. And usually with them, they agree. I'm like, are you sure? You might be pulling down a great from 300 to 200. You may think it looks good. But are you really maintaining the same intent of your furthest throw at 100 feet and 90 and 80? Now, are you missing knee high or shin high or lower, by the way, with full intent? And almost 100% of the time, I basically say 100% of the time, but I don't want to sound like I'm, you know... <laughs> an infomercial kind of thing, but <laughs> I would basically say there's not a kid that can probably tell me with a straight face that I'm wrong. Like, that there are, in other words, not, I'm not saying they're even doing it on purpose, but looking back, they're like, you know what? I, I'm definitely probably not throwing 100%. I'm easing up a little bit subconsciously because I want to make sure I hit my partner. I don't want the coach getting mad at me. Um, and so what they're doing, even though the, the stretching out phase is creating so many benefits of conditioning and endurance and all that good stuff in the field, and the, the, the pretty good pull downs are still creating some arm strength and, and, and accuracy, and they're missing one little piece, one little bonus they're missing, which is they're training their arm to decelerate on a certain level rather than accelerate or at least maintain their, their furthest intent. And that little piece could be the difference between 90 and 94 or 84 and 88, or 94 and 99. It's just you're training your arm. You're still going to have a very, very healthy, durable, well-conditioned arm because of the long cost and the distance. But you're missing out on, it's like, it's, I use the analogy a lot with black belts. It's sort of like your first degree black belt, if you can take 300 feet, sorry, 270 or 300 feet into 60 feet, 6 inches with a gear catcher, and then missing knee on the you're kind of, it's good. You're getting some good pull downs, you're close. I had a fifth degree black belt. I didn't go to a second degree. I went to a fifth degree black belt, can take a 300 foot throw at 60 feet, 6 inches with a gear up catcher, and literally miss at ankle height. Yeah. That to me, without one foot missing of the 300 foot, foot throw, that is the art have a real pull down, and that is how you train the arm to create more of that acceleration and create velocity. And one last thing I'll say, and then I'll go back to you, which is this. When you pull down correctly, you also have to do about 20 other positive things. One, to take 300 feet, which is your max distance, into 60 feet 6 inches with a gear catcher. I'm going to keep saying that for safety reasons. And then you're missing at shin high or lower. Here's the other cool thing. You have to be mentally so quiet and relaxed. Your body has to be so quiet and relaxed. You have to create a new movement pattern in your body, like Bernstein's principle. You have to figure out, how do I get 300 feet of 35 degree angle uphill when my body did that, to organize my body now in a way where I'm figuring out how to get my release point out in front where I feel like I'm touching the grass. 
to pull this off. Yeah. So that means I have to have the most optimal balance. I have to know how to keep my front side in the, in the best way possible. I have to figure out how to be quiet enough to get my release point out in front like the call before the storm without beating myself to the punch. I'm not. So when people say, like, well, long test is sort of like going out as far as you can and then pulling down, they're right in a way. But as you know, and, and you're you're someone who has a lot a lot of experience with this, so you're very intimate with these topics we're talking about. Mm-hmm. The general population, even coaches at the highest level, I truly believe that these nuances you and I are talking about right now, they're a massive deal. It's a different level of training the arm to where this is sort of a a, a piece that opens the door to so many different variables of upside and I think that's why when you get to the top of the pulling down correctly um, people don't realize that like yeah it's, it's getting on top of your long long distance throws but as you can now tell from this long response that man it, it there are so many benefits that's why I don't feel like pitchers need to do as much work off the mound because if you can take a 300 foot throw on flat ground you're not even getting the help of the, of the bump and you can get, you can compress 300 feet into 60 feet 6 inches with a gear catcher at ankle height. Man, your mechanics, in my mind, have to be the most pure, optimal mechanics that exist. 100%, dude. And I think there's a mental component, too. I know, at least for me, was I think when you when your brain says, okay, I need to throw this ball 400 feet, I need to do whatever it takes for my body to be in sync, to apply enough force, to transfer that force, to throw it that far, you know, your brain could see that and, and determine it and, and feed that into your body. It's the brain-body connection. And then I think when it comes to the pull-downs or even off a mount, right, 60 feet, 6 inches, you see that target pretty close to you. Um, and so there's that subconscious... Uh, I don't, for lack of a better term, I can't think of it, but like brake pedal approach. Like I'm just going to throw it to the glove. I'm just going to throw it there. I'm going to place it there or whatever. And I think that the, again, going back to my personal experience with it, the, the, the moment that I took that 400 plus throw and I literally just did that over and over and over and over again. And I think over time, my body just was like, yep, this is that throw. Now just repeat it. And then what happened was when I started coming in, I just was able to repeat it over and over again. And you know what's a, uh, for me, it was a personal cue that I was actually on my way in. If I could just think about like almost long hopping my partner all the way up till about 120 feet, if I could think about long hopping my partner or at least setting my sights to long hop my partner and almost trying to get the ball to rise up into the partner's like belt area. Um, so yep. again, I think that's like, you know, trying to determine, uh, self cues moving forward in your, in your throwing program. All right, guys, that's, uh, the conclusion of part two of the three part Alan Jager podcast. Um, like I said, in the intro to the episode, um, be sure to go check out Twitter, find that contest, enter that contest. You're not going to want to miss, uh, just an opportunity to win some cool, cool stuff, man. Just complete competitor package with elite j bands i mean come on it's on twitter it's easy to enter it's you're following two people me alan jager you're retweeting one tweet a tweet that was released on monday at eight eastern time so if all else fails go to my twitter and see the tweet that was released Monday, 8 Eastern Time. I guess I haven't I haven't described it like that, but I've been trying to tell you what the tweet says and literally just go and see a tweet on my page, at Robbie Rowe underscore one two. My Twitter will be linked in the show notes. Um, and uh, just see the tweet that was released at 8 Eastern Time on Monday, February 4th. <laughs> there you go. Simple as that. Um, yeah, guys. All right. Uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I would uh, love a review. Um, for whatever platform you're listening to it on, guys. Appreciate you guys again. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And um, look forward to dropping part three uh, in a couple days. Cool. All right. Much love, guys. Talk to you later.